It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my first uh, question is to the Premier. The COVID-19 um, virus is posing a serious challenge to public health all over the world. Ontario's public health professionals are rising to the challenge, and we thank them for their hard work. They're working incredibly hard to keep people safe and informed. At this crucial time, what they need from us is uh, resources and unwavering support. Why is the government moving ahead with consultations on eliminating health units and implementing budget cuts at exactly the time when our public health units should be focused on the important work that they have to do here for the people of Ontario? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Well, thank you very much for the question, but the health and well-being of all Ontarians is our government's top priority, here, here. and we are putting all of the necessary resources into making sure that the people of Ontario are safe. We know that uh, we do thank our frontline service providers who are doing an excellent job here, here. under difficult circumstances for their timely response and their commitment to making sure that people remain healthy. We are implementing an enhanced pandemic response that formally brings together a wide range of service providers, and our goal is to make sure that we have comprehensive response planning that includes effective surveillance, prompt laboratory testing, appropriate care and treatment, evidence-based public health measures, and transparent communications, but I will have more to say in the supplementary. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, we've now learned that last week public health agencies wrote to the Ford government asking them to stop their plan for cuts and forced amalgamation of public health units. In a letter, the president of the Association of Local Public Health Agencies asked the government to, and I quote, provide official direction to provide or rather to pause the modernization process at least until co the COVID-19 emergency is declared over. A full analysis of the response has been conducted, and the lessons learned have been applied. In fact, this letter went to the Minister of Health. In case she hasn't seen it, I'll send it over to her by a page so she can have a look at it. My question is, will the government do exactly as they've asked? Will they do exactly as they've asked? Minister? Well, we certainly appreciate the work that our public health units are doing across the province. They are uh, doing a remarkable job. They are working in concert with what we are doing provincially and what we are working with uh, with our federal partners as well. It's really important with COVID-19 that we have that collective comprehensive response to uh, make sure that our system continues to work. If it does not, we have enhanced planning, as I indicated before, to make sure that we can take it to the next step. But as you will know, the uh, speaker speaking through you to the Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Jim Pine is conducting his consultations with our public health units and recognizing the extra work that they're under right now in response to the coronavirus, that we are ensuring that Mr. Pine's consultations are stepped back to allow those public health units to be able to do their work. Response. So yes, we are responding to their concerns. We are taking a longer period of time with those consultations because this is a higher priority right now for the people of Ontario. Here, here. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, I think what they've asked for is a formal directive to ensure that those uh, consultations are completely stopped during this time and a, a reversal of the cuts that the government has already made to public health units. So. Now more than ever, we know that our public health officials need to focus on that incredible work that they are doing, not spend time fending off the Ford government's latest cuts. In their letter, the public health agencies wrote, and I quote, the chronic inadequacy of resources to meet our daily obligations is regrettably brought into sh uh, stark relief when they need to be diverted to emergency response duties. They implore the government speaker to reverse their funding cuts at least until this crisis is over. So will the Premier and the Minister of Health listen Question. to public health units, reverse the cuts and merger plans, and just give them the support they need as they work overtime to keep Ontarians safe? Minister to reply. Speaker, very regrettably, 
I have to say through you to the Leader of the Official Opposition that it is very unfortunate that you would choose to raise these political considerations at a time Shame when it is you. really important for all of the people of Ontario, for the health of the people of Ontario, that we remain a strong, cohesive unit. We are working in concert with our public health units. We are working with our federal counterparts. Our goal as I would say, Speaker, to, again through you, to the Leader of the official Opposition, it should be your goal as well here, here. to make sure that the here, people here. of Ontario are protected. Here, here, here. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Well, Speaker, it is, um, my next question is also to the Premier, but I have to assure the Minister of Health that's why I'm doing my job here, exactly. asking her to do her job and listen to the public health units. That's who's telling her to do exactly Order. what I'm suggesting. As health professionals, uh, they work overtime to confront the challenges of COVID-19, and they have consistently asked people who they think might be ill to stay home. We've all heard them uh, imploring people to stay home if they're feeling sick. And so last week, I asked the Premier whether the government would reverse the move to limit sick days in the province of Ontario and his new requirements that make it mandatory to produce a doctor's sick note if an employer demands it. We are in a very serious situation, Speaker. People need to know that they can stay home and need to know that they're not going to be raked over the coals to get a, to get a sick note produced. Now, I didn't get an answer to this question last week, so I'm asking it again this week. Will the Premier do this? Minister of Health. Well, I would say, Speaker, that the people of Ontario are being extremely responsible in uh, self-monitoring if here, they here. need to. Uh, we have very few people that need to be treated in hospital. Of course, they're being often tested there, but we're looking at expanding our testing facilities. Um, right now, there is no indication that we need to change that with respect to sick notes. As the Leader of the Official Opposition will know, they are not required. Employers are being understanding. We all know that we're in an, in an unprecedented time, and everyone is taking those measures voluntarily as we expect that they would and they are supplementary question well speaker health professionals have been consistently clear cutting available sick days and making sick notes mandatory is bad policy and it's bad policy that puts public health at risk Doctors, nurses, and public health professionals have implored the government to reverse their plans. We're ready and able to work with the government on legislation, Speaker. Something like that could be done easily in, in this week. We could get that done. Will the government do it? Minister. Well, I would say to the Leader of the Official Opposition, we are in daily contact with health professionals across the province. They are working very hard. We thank them very much for their, for their hard work. But uh, it also, the people of Ontario are also being very responsible, and employers are being very responsible. Here, here. It's not necessary to raise that legislation to bring that back, because people are voluntarily doing that, because here, they here. all know that this is important to everyone in Ontario. Great people in Ontario. Order. The final supplementary. Well, well, Speaker, being in contact with uh, with health officials isn't good enough. You have have to actually listen to their advice. That's what you have to do. You know, doctors, nurses, and public health officials have been very clear with this government. Laws that discourage people from taking sick days uh, are going to put public health at risk. Forcing public health units to plan for mergers when they're trying to contain the spread of COVID-19 puts public health at risk. Cuts to public health budgets put public health at risk, Speaker. So why is the government determined to plow ahead with all of these policies when it is so clear that this is not the way to respond to the threat of COVID-19? Minister. Well, several things here. First of all, that we are working with our public health units. They understand that any changes that were made last year will be mitigated by, financially by this government. We have been listening to them. That being said, we are working on a daily basis with our public health officials, as well as with our chief medical officer of health, Dr. Williams, as well as Dr. Yaffe, as well as Dr. Davila, who in the City of Toronto is doing a fantastic job, as well as all of our public health units across this province. We all understand that the 
they, this is a very difficult health situation that we're facing right now, but we do have a system in place that is working, and we need to make sure that we continue to rely on the medical evidence, the scientific evidence that we receive. That is what I am relying on, and we are receiving very good advice. Here, here. Thank you. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Speaker, the increase in class sizes the government imposed this year had real consequences for students in the form of hundreds of cancelled classes and layoffs for teachers and education workers. The latest version of the Ford Conservative plan means class sizes are set to go up again next year, something the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives said could mean 4,000 teaching positions gone by 23-24. Uh, Speaker, there were 7,000 responses and over 10,000 pages of submissions to this own government's consultation that cost them a million dollars. Overwhelmingly, parents, students, teachers, education workers and experts said no to higher class sizes. Why does the government continue to ignore them? Minister of Education. Oh, well, thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, we are negotiating with one aim, and that is to get a deal that keeps every child in this province in class. That is our obligation. It is our commitment, and that's why we're working hard at the table. We invite all of our Federation partners to work with us over the coming days to provide the stability that children in this province deserve after 300-plus days of negotiating. In our, in, our announcement, we, in our announcement, we've been clear we're going to freeze classroom sizes, Speaker, at 23 in elementary school, in high school, and 24.5 in elementary school. We're going to ensure 100 percent of special education funding flows to those with the greatest needs. And Speaker, we're going to protect all-day kindergarten. This is a balanced plan. While we ensure that merit guides hiring, it is a prudent plan, a positive plan for students, and the time is now to get this done, Speaker. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, back to the acting premier. This government wasted $7 million trying to sell a plan that no one is buying. Speaker, this government needs to stop treating the future of our children's Order. education as a public relations exercise and stop treating our kids like bargaining chips. They will continue, while they continue to ignore the will of Ontarians, we're going to help bring those voices back to the conversation. Last week, we posted the summary of their million-dollar consultation that they completely buried. Today, we're posting the seven individual submissions online to once again show that Ontarians do not want crowded classrooms with fewer supports for their kids. Will the Minister of Education stop this game of bait and switch and listen this time? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. I think uh, I think what Ontarians clearly want is a deal that keeps kids in class, and this here, government here. is absolutely here. committed to doing that. And Speaker, you know, in the public discourse, there's a variety of polling that I think demonstrates a momentum towards getting a deal, but not just any deal, a good deal. The one that this government has tabled, that freezes classroom sizes, that ensures class investments in special education continue to flow to the greatest need. It ensures the merit guides hiring. It ensures a reasonable and fair enhancement for benefits and for wages. Speaker, our aim is to get a deal, to work in good faith with our partners. Parents have waited long enough. The time is now. Let's get a deal done for workers, for students, and for parents of this province. Speaker. The next question, the member for Kitchener, Conestoga. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines and Indigenous Affairs attended the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada Conference, better known as PDAC, here in Toronto. Jobs in the mining sector are good quality jobs, many of which are in the skilled trades that offer young people exploring a career path an incredible quality of life. Can the minister please tell us more about what our government is do doing to support Ontario's mining, mining sector? Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mr. Speaker, what a great uh, week we had at PDAC. Uh, my colleague from Nipissing and I uh, announced more than $10.5 million in 28 companies that supply products and services to the mining industry to create and retain over 180 jobs. Now, North Bay, Timmins, and Sudbury have been elevated to world class. Uh, mining uh, service and supply cities, in addition to the mining activities that, that go in and around there, Mr. Speaker. So companies like Coloured Aggregates uh, in Warren, 
uh, got resources to increase production to purchase upgrading equipment, red pocket fertilizer to build a fertilizer granulation facility at the former Hedman plant in Matheson, $309,000 for iTech 2000 Equipment Incorporated in Roslyn to expand its operations and build a warehouse, and of course, uh, uh, it resources for Shift and Sudbury to create a computer simulation tool Bons. that will help mining clients understand the supply chain and identify areas for improvement, Mr. Speaker, and get those three places ready for the next level in mining. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the Minister for that answer. It's fantastic news, news for people uh, not only just in Ontario but in Northern Ontario. In addition to meeting with industry uh, and Indigenous leaders, he signed a historic agreement to finally move forward on a corridor that will help connect the Ring of Fire region to the provincial highway system. Can the minister please tell us more about the announcement he made alongside Premier Ford? Great question. Minister to reply. As the government, we are very pleased to partner with Martin Falls First Nations and Webequay First Nations and actually uh, Arrowland First Nations uh, later, uh, late last fall, Mr. Speaker. This was a historic agreement. For the first time ever, we have a roadmap, Mr. Speaker, from Arrowland First Nation to Webequay First Nation. That has not been in place at any point in time prior to the agreement that we signed on Monday. Here, here. That was a matter of fact. And listen, Mr. Speaker. Chief Ashton Finiskin of Martin Falls First Nations. We're moving ahead with this agreement so all communities in the region can connect to the next phase, which is to secure and bring good paying jobs in mining, construction, and other skilled trades to our communities. Chief Wabas of Webequay, we're looking forward to prosperity so that we can make changes for our communities up there because we are living in poverty. Mr. Speaker, we're pleased Response. to move forward with this. We're going to work with other communities in the area and develop the Ring of Fire, Mr. Speaker, once and for all. Here, Thank here. you. Question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Not even a year ago, the Premier proudly unveiled his new Tory to blue license plate design and bragged that the new plates would be better, more durable, and longer lasting. Nope. Since then, they have ignored safety experts and frontline officers, the official opposition, the media, folks with eyes, and have strangely defended their plates just to end up recalling them wasting time and money. It has been a long road to get back to where we started with white plates. We know this Premier wants this all to go away, and with so many different muck-ups, this government has a lot of damage control on its plate. The minister says Ontarians don't understand business. Well, we can all see this government had no business spending public dollars on a vanity project that blew up in its face. We couldn't see the plates, but we can see the mess. Why won't this government let us see the truth behind this plate gate fiasco? Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I rise in the House this week to remind everyone that we've listened to the concerns, and I'm very pleased in the manner in which our government is focused on delivering an enhanced plate in a timely, secure, and efficient way. And as we're working with our stakeholders and vendors to delivering this product, Order. You know, we're working and Order. testing the enhanced plate with our law enforcement as well as our key stakeholders. And uh, I, again, reinforce the fact to the member opposite that we've listened to concerns and we're taking action, and that is good news for all of Ontario. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. This government refuses to be straight about the disastrous plate redesign and is hiding behind a non-disclosure agreement with 3M. This government has made license plates into a political circus. What is clear is we are back where we started with, hopefully, visible white plates, but we won't be relieved until we see them and actually can see them. Speaker, imagine wondering if we will be able to read license plates. What a mess. And Speaker, you know what else folks want to be able to see? The details and the testing and the plan and the costs of this vanity exercise. The official opposition asked last week, and we're asking again today, for this government to let the people have a look and let the Auditor General behind the curtain. Stop hiding these invisible plates behind a non-disclosure agreement. Will the government do the right thing and actively bring in the Auditor General to look at the numbers and the secrets so Ontarians can finally see the truth behind these license plates? Minister. Well, again, Speaker, I, I, I am very, very fortunate to be in a position whereby we have teams, both at the, with the vendor 
and with the ministry, and we're working diligently around the clock on our enhanced plate because we listen to concerns of Ontario, unlike the previous Liberal government. That said, I look forward to keeping this House and Ontario drivers up to date as we make progress, and thank you very much for the question to the member opposite. Member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Uh, yesterday, we celebrated International Women's Day, and it's time to recognize the achievements of the women's rights movement and the barriers that still remain for women's equality. When women still face gender-based violence in Ontario, and when survivors of sexual violence seek help, they need to access high-quality services as soon as possible by flip-flopping between cancelling funding and then announcing the fund funding the next day, this creates more chaos and confusion. This government is compromising rape crisis centres' ability to plan and lower wait lists. Speaker, can the Deputy Premier explain why the Attorney General cut this funding only for the next day for another minister to announce funding without any details, and on behalf of vulnerable women and girls in this province, will this government Question. provide stable, predictable funding to Ontario's 42 rape crisis centres in the upcoming budget, and will you put your budget through a Thank you very much. The Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member, for the question. I'd like to remind the member that despite the failure to protect women by your government, this government is stepping up. Here, here. I was I was proud to last week announce that our government is annualizing $2 million for sexual assault centres across Ontario. This funding will go to support the important work that we are doing for victims and survivors of sexual assaults and human trafficking with trauma-informed care. We are restructuring to provide better services that truly serve the needs of victims across Ontario, and for the first time, victims are being heard. It is the work of sexual assault centres like these that make a real impact to those seeking services. And there has been a steady rise in the usage of shelters and other forms of, the, of those impacted by sexual assaults and other forms of violence. And this is not news. Thank you, Response. Speaker. The supplementary question. Speaker, I get that it was a 24-hour 24 24 turnaround, but this is a circus without a ringmaster, and this has to stop time and time again. We see this government creating more chaos Order. needlessly for vulnerable people, children with autism, students in classrooms in terms of class sizes, and mandatory online learning. This Order. is not acceptable. The government is reactionary cutting first and consulting later. The uncertainty that Ontario's 42 rape crisis centres are still experiencing while wait lists grow could have been avoided if the government hadn't axed the roundtable on gender-based violence. So will you, as you have said, Minister, listen to the advice of experts and re-establish the roundtable on gender-based violence so that we can have information that informs your decisions? Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. For 15 years, this Liberal government ran deficit after deficit, yet could not find any money for our most vulnerable women and children. In 2013, the Auditor General tabled her annual report on violence against women's services, which found that the previous government had failed to implement recommendations stemming from a 2001 report. That's 12 years. Shame. Right before the election, Order. this government also made empty promises to increase funding, Order. knowing that they could not afford to do so. Mr. Speaker, this government is committed to women and children across this province, and that's why I was honoured to announce our annualized funding of $2 million for sexual assault centres across this province. Ask the government members to stop heckling when one of the government ministers is answering a question. <laughs> Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Niagara West. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Children and Women's Issues. Speaker, human trafficking is a heinous crime, and it is happening in communities and neighbourhoods right across Ontario. It predominantly occurs to young women and girls and largely happens in the form of sex trafficking. 
The average age of recruitment into sex trafficking is just 13 years old. Speaker, last Friday I had the opportunity and the privilege of hosting the minister as well as the premier and solicitor general in the Niagara region to make an important announcement about human trafficking in Ontario. Could the minister please explain to this house what our government is doing to combat this terrible crime? The Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Niagara West for the question and for hosting us on Friday. Speaker, the member is white, right. We cannot pretend that human trafficking isn't happening in Ontario. We cannot pretend that it doesn't happen in our communities. We must do something about it. That is why our government announced our new comprehensive anti-human trafficking strategy. This strategy will invest $307 million over five years to raise awareness work on prevention and early intervention, support survivors, and hold criminals accountable. Speaker, our government has zero tolerance for trafficking and is determined to support survivors and fight this crime head on. I would also like to thank the Minister of Infrastructure for her tireless work on this file for many years, as well as the member from Mississauga Centre and member for Cambridge for their Response. work this past summer in hosting roundtables with those in the front lines. Speaker, our plan was created from the feedback we heard from those that this crime impacts, and we will have more to say in the supplementary. Thank you. The supplementary question. I'd like to thank the minister for her leadership on this file and also acknowledge the work of the Minister of Infrastructure as well as the Solicitor General on this important file. Speaker, the minister mentioned roundtables and listening to those on the front lines. Last summer, I had the opportunity of hosting the minister as well as many different organizations in a roundtable to deal specifically with human trafficking. And I know we heard from many of those who have uh, worked on the front lines in fighting against traffickers as well as those who are providing care, again, such as mental health supports to survivors, as well as hearing survivors' voices. At this table, we heard about the devastating impacts of this crime on Indigenous and marginalized women in the Niagara region and across the province. These stories were real, they were personal, and they were gut-wrenching. Speaker, could the minister tell this House what she learned from the roundtables and how this was implemented into our strategy? Minister to reply. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to, again for the member for that question and for the work that he is doing to bring awareness to his region. Speaker, last summer we held 13 roundtables across the province, and one of the most common things we heard was the need to increase awareness about sex trafficking because it is happening more often than we think. Many do not even realize it is happening right in our neighbourhoods and could be happening to our children, cousins or friends. That is why we want to raise awareness amongst children, parents and the general public on what exactly trafficking is, how to see the signs and where to go for help. I want to thank the Minister of Education for adding human trafficking into the curriculum so that children will know what a healthy relationship looks like, and to the Minister of Transportation for her work to inform those driving on our highways on how to spot trafficking and how to help. Speaker, this is not a partisan issue. Response. We need to work across the aisle, work across sectors, and work across the country to take a meaningful stand against trafficking. The next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. This Friday, the Integrity Commissioner wrote in response to concerns raised by the Chief Commissioner of the Ontario Human Rights Commission, as well as other community organizations, that this government's decision to appoint Toronto Police Officer Randall Arsenault to the OHRC was, in fact, a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. Concerns were raised because this appointment comes at exactly the same time that the OHRC is finalizing their report into racial profiling at the Toronto Police Services and working to help rebuild trust between police and racialized communities. The Integrity Commissioner directed Officer Arsenault to, and I quote, recuse yourself from any OHRC discussions or decision-making related to TPS inquiry or other policing services matters. But according to the OHRC, policing matters make up over 70 percent of their work. Question. Can the Attorney General please explain why he would put Officer Arsenault or any other officer into this difficult position? Questions to the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Mr. Arsenal was appointed to the OHRC 
to support and advance the Commission's mandate. They provide promotion, protection, and advancement of human rights. The Code states that every person appointed to the Commission shall have knowledge, experience, or training with respect to human rights, law, and issues, and he has all three. The Chief Integrity Commissioner determined that to avoid potential conflicts of interest, Mr. Arsenault should recuse himself from cases involving his employer or the criminal justice system. Any member of any commission or any tribunal is subject to the same restrictions regarding their, their employer when they're there on a part-time basis, Mr. Speaker. I want to be absolutely clear. This type of limitation is common and standard and the basic advice that the Integrity Commissioner would give. Mr. Arsenault has dedicated the past 20 years of his life to protecting the vulnerable in our communities as a, as a Toronto Police Officer. and He was the first ever frontline officer to hold the position of Community Engagement Officer. He's also an Aboriginal Liaison Officer. These positions underscore Mr. Arsenault's deep commitment to breaking down barriers between law enforcement and the communities they serve, Mr. Speaker. Our government is proud that Mr. Arsenault has agreed. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's unfortunate that for 70 per cent of the job, he will not be able to do it. The work of the OHRC is invaluable to this province, and its independence is what allows it to hold government to account. The OHRC ensures that each one of us in this chamber makes decisions that protect the human rights of all Ontarians. That's why a transparent and systemic appointment process is so crucial. And yet this government has ignored the agreed-upon process and violated the independence of the OHRC. OHRC. This government is showing time and again that it does not respect the rights of all Ontarians. This government will not ban the illegal practice of carding, and it refuses to take seriously racism in law enforcement, education, social services, or health care. Will the Attorney General rescind this disturbing appointment today and demonstrate to Ontarians that Question. they are done meddling with the Ontario Human Rights Commission? Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, it's very disappointing that the opposition would reject the kind of individual who has experience and knowledge, frontline experience, in exactly the issues that the Commission is dealing with. Unfortunately, he'll be unable to participate in some of those because he will follow the rules, Order. Mr. Speaker. And to reject that he has anything to contribute to the body of the Commission is just ludicrous, Mr. Order. Speaker. We do not draw lines either or, Mr. Speaker. We draw on the knowledge of all Ontarians to help all Ontarians. Here, here. Order. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I just have to say, just like the old white and blue license plates, it's good to be back in my place. <laughs> so my question is for the Minister of Health. Minister, vision is an important part of learning and brain development. Most children do not receive a routine eye examination before the age of six, even though vision accounts for 80% of learning. In September 2019, public health units became responsible for a vision screening program. Every child should have their vision screened before the age of six. Speaker, I understand the government's cuts to public health and lack of dedicated funding to this vision screening program have led some health units not to implement this or not implement it fully. So can the minister explain why the government is moving forward with cuts to public health? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Well, I thank the member very much for the question. As I've indicated in previous responses, there has been a change, however, as of January 1st this year, but the change has been mitigated. Any economic impacts have been mitigated so that there is uh, the, an opportunity for all public health units to continue in their basic operations. That is what they are able to do. They are under, they are working extra, I understand that right now, in dealing with COVID-19, but it is very very important for every child to have an eye screening done before they start school. That is something that we would expect our public health units to participate in, and they are. The supplementary question. Well, I thank the minister for that answer, but it's, it's actually not happening across the province evenly, and that's not good for kids. And it's just one example of why public health is important to families. And so, you know, right now, we just talked about, and I've heard the members opposite talking about the most important thing in public health right now. COVID-19. It's not on our doorstep anymore. It's here. So cuts and proposed changes to cost share in public health risk diminishing capacity. And I know the minister's talking about mitigating things right now. That's fine. But when you talk about cutting, people make decisions, right? And they make decisions just like happened in education where the class sizes grew because boards felt they had to make a decision. So I'm asking you today, through you, Speaker, 
Will the minister commit today not to cut base funding for uh, public health units and not to change the cost sharing with municipalities in the next budget? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. Minister. Well, thank you very much for the question. The changes were made, of course, before the coronavirus hit Ontario. That said, our public health units are responding very capably to this. If there are issues where they are not able to provide their basic funding, then I urge them to be in contact with us. We want to work with them to make sure that they can. The changes were made so that every public health unit should be able to conduct their basic activities with respect to children's vision and the other issues. They are dealing with COVID-19 right now. As I indicated in a previous response that Mr. Pine, with the consultations that he is doing, he's slowing down on those or, or, or holding them in abeyance while the public health units deal with COVID-19. We need to make sure that we deal with the most pressing issues. COVID-19 is the most pressing issue in Ontario right now, response. and the public health units are responding very appropriately to that. Next question, the member for Milton. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Finance. Our government has continued to respond quickly and appropriately to the developing situation around COVID-19. We learned this morning that trading was halted on TSX after stock prices fell at opening. As our government continues to prioritize the health and public safety, we are also well aware of the potential economic impact of this situation as it continues to unfold. Could the minister please inform the House what led to the temporary halt on trading this morning? Mr. Finance. Mr. Speaker, thank you to the member from Milton for that question. What we saw this morning was the systems that support our capital markets working. Mr. Speaker, trading on major North American exchanges, including the TSX, was temporarily halted this morning. At 9.46, a market one or a level one market-wide circuit breaker was triggered on the TSX, as on several other markets, and that triggering halted temporarily the trading of stocks. Mr. Speaker, we continue to monitor this situation closely. COVID-19 is having an impact on the economy, and be assured that we are working diligently to be aware of its impacts and to respond to them as required. Supplementary question. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for his response. Mr. Speaker, our government is aware of the uncertainty that currently exists, but understand the importance of managing these risks. Could the minister please explain the steps our government is taking to ensure we're prepared to respond to the potential economic impact as the situation continues to unfold? Minister Finance. Mr. Speaker, thank you again to the, to the member. First and foremost, I know all of this in this legislature, our thoughts are with those who are directly affected and those families. And Mr. Speaker, again, I want to commend the work of the Deputy Premier and the Minister of Health and all of the frontline health professionals who are making a difference right now to make sure that Ontario's response is the proper response. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to the economy, I have been in regular contact with senior members of the business community, my finance uh, minister colleagues across uh, the country, to ensure that we are coordinating our response and that we are aware of the economic impacts. This province will make sure that the resources that are necessary to respond to this health emergency are in place. And Mr. Speaker, we will also make sure that we monitor the economic impacts and that we are diligent about ensuring that not only the health and safety of Ontarians is protected, but the economy is protected as well. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto University Rosedale. University Thank you, Rosedale. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Over 50,000 transit riders in the GTA take both GO Transit and the TTC on their daily commute. Metrolinx currently has a discounted double fare program that saves these riders up to $720 a year. But at the end of this month, March 31, the discounted double fare program is ending. Residents of the GTA are already paying hundreds of dollars a month to commute using public transit. Instead of forcing 50,000 transit riders to pay an extra $720 a year, will the Premier reverse his cuts and keep the discounted double fare program? The Associate Minister of Transportation, GTA. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Our ministry is aware that the contract uh, is nearing its end on March 31st, and that's thanks to the Kathleen Wynne and Del Duca government that uh, did not budget appropri appropriately to keep this program going. But that being said, Mr. Speaker, our Minister of Transportation, ha Transportation has taken concrete action. A number of months ago, she has instructed and directed Metrolinx, Metrolinx to work very closely with the TTC uh, to come up with solutions and recommendations. Mr. Speaker, those recommendations have now been submitted to the Ministry of Transportation for the Minister's review, and she will have more to say in the upcoming days. Thank you. Talk for a minute, please. Yeah. Remind the members that when we refer to each other, we're going to refer to each other by our Ryden name or our ministry title, correct ministry title, by the way, as appropriate. Start the clock. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. This cut is on this government. The Liberal yeah. government had their own cuts. This cut is on this government. In the last budget, the Premier cut Metrolinx's annual funding by $184 million. This government cancelled hundreds of millions of dollars in planned annual gas tax funding the municipal transit systems were counting on. It is this government that is forcing transit riders to pay an extra $1,200 a year to park their car at GO stations, and it is this government, this government that is forcing over 50,000 GO riders to pay $720 a year starting March 31. Will the Premier stop making life more unaffordable for people and reverse these transit cuts? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to remind everybody in the House that it was that party that, that supported the Liberal, uh, previous Liberal administration 97 per cent of the time. Order. Opposition come to order. And while that previous administration ignored the transit needs of the people in Toronto and in the greater Toronto area, we are not, Mr. Speaker. That's why we've made a historic investment of $28.5 billion. But do you know what that means? That means that hundreds of thousands of people are going to have ac access to subways. That's going to bring relief to hundreds and thousands of families. And I am extremely proud of the work that our minister is doing. Thank you. The next question, the member for Flamborough-Glanbury. Good morning, Mr. Speaker, and my question is to the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. We know that the previous Liberal government members sit here happy to defend the status quo, but in 2016, the Auditor General discovered that under their watch, only 1 per cent of people on social assistance found work. The Liberals did absolutely nothing to fix this. Zero. In the last election, people across Ontario, including in my riding of flamborough glanbrook voted for change. They voted for a government that would put people first. And our government is taking action. In my community, a new system manager was recently selected to improve results that help more people find and keep quality jobs. Can the minister please tell us more about selection of service managers and how this will help people find good jobs. Good question. Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you to our outstanding member from Flamborough Glenbrook uh, for that great question this morning. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, our priority is to ensure that people find and keep quality jobs in Ontario. In a highly competitive, open and fair process, 16 qualified bidders competed to improve our employment services. The technical strengths of a proposal finding the managers best suited to deliver results were weighed approximately three times more than the cost of the proposal. Mr. Speaker, non-profit consortium FedCap won in the region of Hamilton, Niagara. Michael Boskett, Deputy Opposition Commissioner come to order. of Social Services in New York City, has worked with them for eight years. He described them as thorough and comprehensive. Member for Niagara Falls will withdraw the unparliamentary comment that he just made. Uh, Minister, wind up your answer, please. Mr. Speaker, uh, he described them as thorough and comprehensive. He said they help people with medical or mental health conditions attain their maximal le maximum level of self-sufficiency. Mr. Speaker, Aunt? that's what we want for the people of Ontario: better employment outcomes. Thank you. The supplementary question. 
Thank you, Minister. For our, clearly, our government is looking for the best and most qualified candidates to manage our employment services. Right. And I'm pleased that FedCap was selected in Hamilton, Niagara. Order. The consortium also includes current leaders in our system like community living. FedCap has 85 years of experience helping those with disabilities find work. In fact, they often serve even more clients with barriers than they are required to do. While the opposition continues to defend a failing system that is leaving people behind, our government is putting people at the centre of every decision that we make. Can the minister please tell us more about the system managers that were selected? Minister. Well, thank you again, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank uh, the MPP, who is clearly the strongest voice in this House for Hamilton and area. Thank you very much for that. Mr. Speaker, I am also pleased that we have selected Stanford Fleming College and North Muskoka Corpus and APM Group in Peel Region. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Member for Hamilton East Stony Creek, come to order. 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 Restart the clock. Minister, please conclude your answer. I'm pleased, Mr. Speaker, that we have selected Sir Stanford Fleming College and Muskoka Quarthas and APM Group in Peel Region. Fleming College has over 50 years of community experience. Each year, they serve 3,000 job seekers. APM Group has been serving people with disabilities for over 25 years. Last year alone, Mr. Speaker, they served 350,000 people across 670 Response. locations in 10 countries. Mr. Speaker, our government will always stand with the most vulnerable people in this province. We'll give them a hand up and we'll work with them every single day to find meaningful employment right across the province. Southwestern. The next question. Good morning, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the, uh, for the uh, Deputy Premier. We are in the midst of a housing crisis. After 15 years of Liberal inaction, the Conservatives continue to turn a blind eye to the skyrocketing housing costs. In my riding, we are losing the few affordable rental units still available. My constituents recently came to me upset that their non-profit housing provider New Espadina Garment Corporation, located at 35621 Eglinton Avenue West, is changing their rent gear to income units to market rent units, resulting in some tenants seeing $1,000 a month rent increases. People are being priced out of their own homes. That is wrong, Mr. Speaker. Why has this government done nothing to protect tenants during this housing crisis? Good question. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, answer. Speaker. And through you to the uh, member for York Southwestern, I want to thank you uh, very much for the question. Uh, I, uh, I know how crucial uh, a home is. Uh, it basically uh, is, the, is, is a pivotal part in anyone's life. So I, I, I hear what you're saying, and I understand uh, the stress that some of your constituents are going through based on. Uh, the little bit of example that you've, you've given me. Uh, rental housing is a, is a very important part of our housing supply action plan. It's something that was one of the five pillars uh, of that plan, and uh, I've said in this House uh, many times that part of our consultation as part of the housing supply action plan was to look at potential changes uh, to Fonts. the Residential Tenancies Act. Uh, we are still reviewing what we heard as part of the Housing Supply Action Plan, and I'll have more to say in the coming days. I can't wait to hear it. The supplementary question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, again, um, uh, my question is to the Deputy uh, Premier. I don't think I heard an answer there. It is bad enough. I have vulnerable constituents being evicted, but it gets worse. This housing provider, New Spadina Garment Corporation, isn't even following proper procedures. We're notifying tenants of massive rent increases. It is this government's responsibility to stand up for tenants and enforce the lax rules that are on the books now. 
But these Conservatives can't even do that. I'll keep fighting for my constituents because I know everyone deserves an affordable, safe place to call home. Yes. Again, to the Deputy Premier, Mr. Speaker, when will your government stand Question. up for Ontarians and enforce the legislation and make housing providers stop turning folks out onto their out onto the streets. Minister. Well, thanks again, uh, Speaker, and again through you to the honourable member. Uh, we are reviewing changes uh, to the Residential Tenancies Act. We heard loud and clear by, from both landlords and tenants, quite frankly, as part of the Housing Supply Action Plan on the need for change. The Attorney General is well aware of some of the changes that are being proposed uh, for the Landlord Tenant Board. That was something, again, as part of our Housing Supply Action Plan that, uh, that were priorities of the, uh, this government moving forward. But, but Speaker, I, I do want to correct uh, the Honourable Member's record, because when uh, the New Democrats and the Liberals uh, and the Green Party voted against the Housing Supply Action Plan. They voted against 17,802 new purpose-built rental applications to the GTA. They voted against uh, a high of new rental starts in Toronto, a new high that goes back to 1992. It's a quarter-century increase in terms of rental housing. Thank you. The next question, the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Recently, the Minister of Municipal, Municipal Affairs and Housing was in Quinney West to announce new consultation. From day one, our government has been focused on making life more affordable for the people of Ontario, and we know that housing is a big part of that. Through you, Mr. Speaker, could the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing please explain how the proposed community benefits charge will help more Ontarians find a place to call home? Good question. Again, the Minister of Municipal yeah, Affairs thanks, and Housing. Again, uh, thank you very much uh, to the Honourable Member for that, uh, that excellent question. Uh, we know that uh, to tackle Ontario's housing crisis, we need to build uh, more homes in this province. We consulted. Uh, we heard loud and clear that home builders want more certainty uh, around this. That's why we introduced a new uh, proposed community benefits charge framework. The charge gives, as I said, more certainty uh, to home builders, while at the same time, uh, giving municipalities more flexibility to fund important community services through a community benefits charge. Municipalities are going to be able to raise revenues through both development charges and uh, the community uh, benefits charge to support complete communities, and I'll be pleased to uh, answer more in the supplementary. Here, here. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to hear that the minister is taking decisive action to help fix a housing crisis that was worsened by 15 years of Liberal inaction. As communities grow and more homes are built, we know that they need community services, like parks, libraries, recreation centres and more. I thank the minister for taking the politics out of planning by replacing Section 37 agreements. Through you, Mr. Speaker, can the minister please explain how this, this will help ensure the growth pays for growth. Absolutely. Minister. Well, thank you, That's the key. member. And I want to say unequivocally to that last point that our government uh, maintains the concept of growth uh, paying for growth. Here, here. And that's what we wanted to do with our new community benefits charge. That's why, uh, as part of our consultation on community services, we heard that things like parkland, affordable housing, and childcare facilities that could be funded uh, from this charge. We're also uh, proposing to making public libraries, uh, recreation facilities, uh, parks development, public health, and long-term care all 100 per cent recoverable uh, for municipalities. Sense. And that's on top of waste diversion uh, and ambulance services being 100 per cent recoverable. This was part of More Homes, More Choice, uh, our government's housing supply action plan. Mr. Speaker, again, we support growth paying for growth and giving municipalities the resources to support complete communities. So thank you very much for the question. The next question, member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. One of my constituents, Kaylee, lives in a secondary rental unit, a condo that's leased in, by a private, from a private landlord. Kaylee is a young professional who just moved to Toronto. She's a mental health worker. The unit that Kaylee lives in is new, and so is the building. Last month, Kaylee's landlord, landlord served her with a notice that her rent would be going up 10 per cent. Everyday people in this province have not seen their salaries go up by 10 per cent. 
Kaylee has not seen her salary go up by 10 percent. But somehow, this Conservative government thinks that it's fair that Kaylee's rent should be going up by 10 percent. How can the Premier justify gutting rent control for new buildings and driving tenants to the edge of eviction? Great Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker, and uh, through you to the, uh, the member opposite, thank you for the question. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to guess that Kaylee, uh, her building is a newer building that was opened after November 15th when, as part of our fall economic statement, we made the change uh, regarding uh, rent control. Again, uh, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to provide information about the Landlord-Tenant Board and about uh, more t uh, information around the actual lease agreement, which would, have, uh, which would have had that. So there's a way that I can help in making sure that information is, is given. I would, I would be more than happy to, to work with the member to ensure that. Uh, Purpose-built rental are very necessary. Uh, for uh, increasing the affordability of accommodation. Again, from the very first time uh, that member stood in her place and asked me about response, housing. I indicated that housing supply was something that our government was going to uh, uh, put as a priority. And again, and we we've seen uh, historic we've investments seen in purpose built rental in this province because of that policy. It's true. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and respectfully through you back to the Minister. We don't need more information about your rent control loopholes. We need you to close the rent control loopholes in this province. It is outrageous that rents can be raised by any amount a landlord thinks that they can get away with. My riding of Toronto Centre has the highest per capita use of food banks. It also has the largest concentration of community housing units in all of Canada. Speaker, the residents of my riding can't afford 10 per cent rent increases every year uh, without being literally driven out onto the street and into homelessness. Speaker, will the acting premier commit today, right now, to reverse the rent control loophole created by this Conservative government and provide real rent control that will protect the tenants of Ontario? Right. Minister. Uh, again, Speaker, back to the member. The, the short answer is no. Uh, you know, we've seen since uh, our decision uh, to uh, protect uh, existing tenants uh, under rent control, but at the same time allowing for new purpose-built rental, uh, we've seen uh, a, a huge uptake in a purpose-built rental. It doesn't matter what number, Speaker, that I use. I, I could use CMHC, Urban Nation. RBC Economics, every one of those reports, and there are more coming every month, show that we are going back to historic levels of purpose-built rental, in some cases, Speaker, back to 1992 levels when uh, you know, her party was, in, was uh, wow, on was the government side. We're going to continue enough. to work with every uh, well, partner in the system to provide more housing choice. That's the pillar of our Housing Supply there. Action Plan, to provide more housing and more choice and more purpose-built rental. That's what we were elected to do. Thank you very much. Next question, member for Perth Wellington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, speaker, my question is to the Associate Minister of Energy. Oh. Natural gas is Ontario's most common heating source and is much more affordable than other home heating sources, such as electricity, oil, or propane. Through our government's natural gas expansion support program, we are taking action to expand uh, access to natural gas to rural, remote, and indigenous communities across our, our province. Could the associate minister please update this house on the first phase of the natural gas expansion support program and the benefits that Ontarians are seeing from expanded access to natural gas? Great the associate minister of energy. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the honourable member from Perth Wellington for the great question and the excellent work that he does on behalf of his constituents. Through the first phase of this program, unserved areas in communities like Chatham-Kent, South Bruce, the Chippewas of the Thames, and Scugog Island are seeing the benefits of this program. Residents in these communities will save between $800 and $2,500 on home heating costs, and in Chatham-Kent, the additional rural natural gas capacity could create up to 1,400 jobs in the greenhouse industry alone. In Scugog, where I had the honour of travelling with a great member from Durham last Friday, we announced that that actual pipeline was under construction in Scugog Island, and residents are eagerly awaiting the completion of the project and excited to get connected. Mr. Speaker, we know that expanding access to natural gas to rural, northern and indigenous communities creates a more competitive business environment and makes life more affordable for insurance. Great answer. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Um, 
Uh, speaker, uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for his response. I'm very pleased to hear the success of the first phase of this important program. It is great to see that our government is encouraging partnerships between communities and distributors to deliver projects to communities that need and want them. Could the Associate Minister please tell this House about what our government plans to build on the success of Phase 1 and the Natural Gas Expansion Support Program? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, a great question from the Honourable Member from Perth-Wellington. In December, the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines and I wrote to the Ontario Energy Board to direct them to begin the process of collecting information about new natural gas expansion opportunities across Ontario and to develop a report on eligible projects. Last Friday, I was pleased to announce that the OEB is now accepting applications for the projects to be considered for the funding for Phase 2. The second phase of this program will allocate approximately $130 million to support new expansion projects across our province. I have already heard from numerous municipalities that are keen to partner with the natural gas utility and submit projects for consideration. I am also happy to host a natural gas roundtable at the Rural and Churro Municipal Association's 2020 conference, where all attendees told me how excited they were for the next phase of this important program. Mr. Speaker, we are continuing to move forward to expand access to safe, reliable, and low-cost heating fuel, which will lead to more affordable home heating for families Response. and more investment for businesses across our great province. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Brampton North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. At the recent 360, Canada 360 Economic Summit, the Premier said, quote, Buy America policies are hurting Ontario businesses and workers. DNR Electronics, a proud Ontario business with its headquarters in Bolton, Ontario, has twice written to the Premier to express their concerns that the Ontario Provincial Police continues to purchase and equip OPP enforcement vehicles with U.S. manufactured vehicle equipment. DNR manufacture similar vehicle equipment, manufacture similar vehicle equipment to that purchased by the OPP in the United States. They already sell this equipment for other police officer forces in Ontario, such as Durham, Waterloo, and York Region, to name a few. They employ local police Question. and local people, and throughout Peel Region. A contract of this type can create 75 to 100 good-paying jobs. Why won't the Premier answer the concerns of an Ontario manufacturer? Thank you very much. To respond on behalf of the government. The Minister of Economic Development. Traders, we have a fundamental obligation to ensure that Ontario companies have the greatest market uh, access possible and will continue to push for free and fair trade, two-way free and fair trade with all of our partners. And we do this, uh, Speaker, by combating protectionist policies, the policies that hurt workers on both sides of the border. And that's uh, why we continue to strengthen our economic ties, Speaker, uh, in the uh, certainly, amongst all of the global uncertainty, we find that on the uh, stats can last week talked about the fact that Ontario Order. is uh, indeed a sea of tranquility, and our government will continue, Speaker, to be focused uh, on the economy uh, and our continue with our, our plan for job creation. Thank you. Yeah, that concludes.